There it is. Hey. All right, you got me. Hi, you're Jeff. I'm Jeff, Jeff and you are BJ Thomas. The yeah, BJ thank you. <laughs> I am so thrilled to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Man, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Well, it's not often I talk to a legend, you know, so I'm having a good morning. <laughs> uh, well, well, I appreciate that. I have to tell you, BJ, you have the distinction in my life. Uh, when I think back, the very first song that I can remember, uh, other than a nursery rhyme, is Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. I must have been is that five, right? five or six years old. I mean, that is one of the earliest songs. You and Glenn Campbell are in there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, me and Glenn were kind of close together all those years. But, uh, he, he was with me the night uh, when I performed on the Academy Award show. We, had, we were in the same dressing room. But that, Glenn, he, Glenn and I, Glenn was doing True Grit, you know. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is a total thrill for me. So you've had such an influence on my life, my early childhood. And it's the 50th anniversary of Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Uh, you know, tell me about the first time that you heard that song. Was it played to you by Burt Bacharach or... Tell me that situation. Yeah, it was. Uh, I had been uh, I had been recording in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was doing pretty good there. I was cutting hit records, and uh, when uh, Florence Greenberg, the lady that owned Scepter Records, came to me and uh, said, be, asked me, would, would you move up to to New York City? And Gloria and I had just gotten married, and she said, you know, if you'll move up, I think I can get you a session and a song with Burt Bacharach and Hal David. And of course, I had been up to the New York offices, and I'd seen Burt and and met him and he was just an awesome, you know, handsome, charming guy. And, and uh, I was very familiar with all the beautiful classic records that he has written. Uh, and Dion was with Scepter, their mainstay. And uh, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So I did, I moved up and I had been, oh, you know, I'd, I'd go by Bert's uh, apartment he had in, in Manhattan uh, once or twice a week and we would look for songs and and uh, he was playing me songs, and we hadn't found one yet, but uh, pretty quick uh, uh, was when the bicycle scene came up, uh, when they had the song for Butch Cassidy. I didn't know anything about the bicycle scene or what it was, but when I heard the song, I, I just had a, a great feeling about it. I knew it was going to be great. And then, then I started thinking, well, I'm going to record this thing with Burt Bacharach and Hal David and Paul Newman's in the movie, and uh, what could go wrong? So I had a great feeling about it. And uh, we flew out to California, and it just so happened. I had just done three weeks of one-nighters, and uh, I, uh, my throat was killing me. So I went to the doctor, and he, and the doc said, that, you know, hey, B, he said, this, this is the worst throat I've ever seen. He said, I don't want you to even speak for two weeks. And I said, oh, doc, I'm, you know, I've got <laughs> so. But anyway, it, was, it wasn't a question of me not showing up. So I, I, I thought Burt might be upset about my throat but uh, when I went out for rehearsal the day before the uh, the session he never said a word he he liked he kind of liked the way it sounded and uh, so it was a little rough but uh, I, we did the bicycle scene and uh, then about six weeks later we recut the song in the, in New York for, for the uh, the single which was the number one record and, and back in the late 60s and early 70s, like stu studios were obsessed with getting some sort of song attached to a movie. And because uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Webb did for Doc, you know, but they always wanted something like that. But your song was so contemporary. Uh, were you concerned about being inserted into a Western? It was just, did it fit? It no, did. And the, you know, Je Jeff, I, I wasn't because I know a lot of people say, oh, it didn't make any sense and everything, but it made, a, a, a made sense to me. I mean, here were these outlaws, they were, Finally, had found a place where they uh, they weren't running, and uh, you know, the, out with the Edda Chase, and he he's taking a bicycle ride, and it made it made sense to me. I think I think uh, of course, Bacharach and David they deserve a lot of credit for even creating this this genre of uh, movie, movie songs, and they had a, they had many of them that they made work beautifully. So it all it always made sense sense to me, you know. Well, I can't imagine that movie without that song. You know, it's it's such an integral me either, part. Yeah, me either. <laughs> me either. And then it showed up in a few other movies, and that was just all. You know, it was just something about raindrops, um, as something about what it says is really so true, uh, and has so much meaning with life. You know, the rain might be falling on you, but if you're free, um, you're okay. You know, so it it kind of worked across the board. 
Well, the song hit number one on Billboard Hot 100 for four weeks, 300,000 copies a day it was selling. It was an international hit. When did it hit you back then that this was just a freight train that was not going to stop? Well, you know, it, 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 it kind of hit me right away because when it came, the song actually came out in October of 69 and uh, radio w resisted it. They wouldn't play it. And uh, it got some terrible reviews and got a bad review in Life magazine. And, and they said the worst song they've ever written and all, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And of course, we wanted WABC and to play it in New York City, but they wouldn't play it. They said uh, BJ's singing a wrong note in the first verse, you know. And so they, there was a lot of resist resistance to the song. But, you know, the Butch Cassidy, you know, thank goodness, was such a great movie uh, and was so popular and became the number one movie. It was released Christmas time, 69. And once the movie was out, man, the song just took off and uh, I, I loved it. I mean, I loved that song for three or four years. Uh, just sold as many records every day as I'd sold previously. So great. Well, not only musically was it a hit, but then performing at the Oscars. So tell me about when they called you and that special night, because that had to be one of those highlights of your career. Oh man. I mean, uh, that was great to get that. I think they had originally uh, scheduled the fifth dimension to sing that, to sing the song. And uh, my good my good friend, who was a uh, and R uh, director with Scepter Records, a guy by the name of Steve Tyrell, who's a popular singer right now, uh, we grew up together. He was like a brother brother to me. So he he went to work on it, and he had a he had a friend that was in the academy, and whatever the story actually was. But he got me in, and they they wanted me then to to sing the song because I was singing it in the movie. And uh, so I got the shot to do it. And, uh, you know, of course, I was really, you know, I was so nervous. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it came off, it came off well. I kind of wore um, the Sundance Kids outfit and uh, came to play. And then at rehearsal, we had such, it was such a big production number that I had to feel, I had a feeling, you know, I think, I think uh, we're going to win this thing. So as it turned out pretty well. <laughs> and, and you had to have met Robert Redford and Paul Newman at some point. Then tell me about that. Never, never met. Never, oh, never no. met, never met Redford or, or Newman. And as a matter of fact, you know, Mr. Backrack just had a book out a few years ago called uh, "Anyone Who Had a Heart." And Bert Backrack said in the book he had never met Paul Newman. He never met Robert Redford. He never met George Roy Hill, the, the, the director. And uh, and so it made me feel better because I hadn't met him either, you know. Well, you got to get up to I Sundance. Got to get up to Sundance him. and meet Robert Redford. He's up there, you know. I and bet I he'd played, love to meet you, know, you. I played Park City, Utah, and uh, the, actually with the, there was a front table that has his had his name, uh, Robert Redford's name on it. He was reserved to be there, but he he never showed up. So as it as it turns out, I never I never met him. Well, you know, BJ, you're immortal when Homer and Marge Simpson on The Simpsons sing raindrops keep falling on my head, you know. You know you've made it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know you've done it when, you, when you've had that. But uh, that, that song has done some, some beautiful things for me. Well, I understand you may be touring in 2021 if everything goes right. Are you going to stop in Vegas? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we work the Golden Nugget out there once or twice a year. And uh, I've, I've been working there since 1980. And I've worked some other places there, but the Golden Nugget is kind of my home out there. So we're looking forward to getting back on the road. You know, it kind of, it, it's, I've had to put off a recording session in Muscle Shoals and uh, some disappointment with the, this unbelievable thing that's happening. But uh, we'll reschedule and hopefully I'll be back. We're just waiting, you know, we're just waiting on the vaccine. We need a good vaccine so we know that we're safe and uh then we'll, we'll be ready to get, get right back on the road. Well, PJ, this has been an incredible opportunity. Thank you so much going down memory lane with the, one of the greatest songs ever written. And I hope you're safe and stay well. And I'll look forward to seeing you in Vegas. We'll talk again when you get here. Jeffrey, I appreciate you talking to me and uh, uh, giving me time. Thanks for your, for your support. And uh, I look forward to seeing you when I get out to Las Vegas. You've got it. Be well, BJ. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you.